Good morning, students of physical science energy. I'm recording your last lecture on energy and energy transformations today. Let's get all situated here and get started. All right. The essential question that goes with this lecture is what are different forms of energy? A secondary question to that is how does the law of conservation of energy explain the energy transformation system? Um, a lot of you covered energy in your seventh grade middle school science class, so you'll know a lot of the information in today's lecture. Um, I usually start this unit with thinking of as many different types of energy as you can. And um, usually people have a lot of ideas because um, the seventh grade science um, teachers did a really good job teaching you all this. Um, so the first one that usually gets thrown out is potential energy. Um, kinetic energy also gets thrown out. Thermal energy, light energy, radiation. Um, also, we, we kind of know this idea already about um, energy can never be created or destroyed. Hopefully you've heard of that or heard of that um, law of conservation of energy. Um, some sub questions that you still might be thinking about. Um, what is energy and how is it measured? So even though you know that these different types of energies exist, you might not know what exactly energy is and how it can be measured. You might want to know more about mechanical energy. Um, you want to know some types maybe of potential energy and how to calculate different types of potential energy. You might still want to know or be wondering about what are some types of kinetic energy and how to calculate types of kinetic energy. And uh, what is the law of conservation of energy? And then what is energy transformation? What does it mean for energy to get transformed um, or transferred from one object to another? Um, by the end of today, hopefully we'll have covered um, more of this unit on energy and you'll be able to say that I can describe and identify the types of energy. I can calculate the amount of potential energy and kinetic energy in a system. I can explain and apply the law of conservation of energy to a situation. And I can explain the energy transformations in a system. Hopefully these are all things that you'll be able to do by the end of today. And if you didn't know these uh, energy here on the left, that's fine. We're gonna uh, review them in today's lecture. Okay, so the first type of question we're gonna consider here, oops, that slide, I moved my face around and Topic question number one, what is energy and how is it measured? Energy is defined as the ability to do work. Energy cannot be seen or touched, but every time the light bulb is lit, Music is played, a fan spins, or food is cooked, energy made it happen. So energy is all around us, but the definition of energy is the ability to do work. Okay, work is defined in science and in phys physics classes in your future um, as the amount of force applied over a distance. And we can calculate that. We talked all about forces the last couple of weeks, and so now, we know that we can calculate the amount of work on an object by multiplying the amount of force in newtons times the distance that the object moves. So if you multiply force times distance, you get the amount of work done and energy, that ability to do work. So you can actually calculate the amount of energy in any, um, in any object. Uh, we usually go over this equation a little bit more in depth in the classroom, but I just wanted to introduce you to this um, uh, relationship between force and distance uh, multiplied together equals work. So if you have a person that has a 300 kilogram ball and they push it with a force of 500 newtons, but it does not move anywhere, there's no movement, um, doesn't matter how long the person is pushing it for, 10 seconds here, um, it's because there's no movement, there's no distance that this big 300 kilogram ball moved, the work done on the object is zero joules. That's because 500 times zero is zero, or anything times zero, if it doesn't have any distance moved, is still going to be zero. So that was zero joules of energy over here on this left hand side situation. Um, on the right hand side, on the other hand, um, 
the man pushes on the ball with 500 newtons of force. Um, the 100 kilogram ball this time moves a distance of six meters. So six meters times 500 newtons gives you 3,000 joules of energy. So this person is 3,000 joules of energy in order to um, get this needed. Uh, 3,000 joules of energy in order to get this ball to move, 100 kilogram ball. Um, this is also three kilojoules, because kilojoule is a thousand times a joule. All right, so that is how you calculate the amount of work that on an object. So who has done the most work? In this situation, it would be the person on the right, because they actually moved the ball, um, and this person did no work or zero joules of work, um, while the right hand is person did 3,000 joules of work. Okay, um, energy is measured in the units of joules. You don't usually hear joules a lot um, in our everyday lives um, as a unit of energy. Um, so the other units for energy that are equivalent to a joule um, is a newton meter because newtons times meters equals a joule. And then joule per second is equal to watts of energy. Um, Watt is usually what we hear in everyday life, so I thought that you guys would like seeing that 60 joules per second is um, equal to 60 watts, and that's what are the units for energy. Okay, um, talking more now about mechanical energy. Um, this slide mechanical energy is the uh, product of adding potential energy and kinetic energy together. Um, they're saying that potential energy is stored on stored energy that depends on an object's mass and position or shape, and kinetic energy is the energy of motion that depends on an object's mass and speed. And the combination of having kinetic energy and potential energy in any object would lead to it having some sort of mechanical energy or ability to move. Okay, um, I really like this flow chart a lot about forms of energy. Um, so it says, can be either kinetic or potential. And we're going to go through all of these different types of energies, of kinetic energy. Um, we'll talk about thermal, mechanical, electrical, and magnetic energy. And we've kind of talked a lot about magnets already. Um, so we might not get to that one, but we will talk about a few of these other types of energy. Um, energy can be experienced in different ways. It can be experienced in sound energy and light energy. Um, and we're not classifying these as either kinetic or potential. Um, they're kind of different types of energy that we experience in a different way. And we're still learning a lot about these two different types of energy. And so we're going to put them um, here. Um, sound energy is probably more kinetic energy, um, but it could also be argued that there is some energy as well. So they're kind of in between here in the both categories. Um, potential energy is stored energy. And we're going to talk about a lot of these different types of stored energy chemical energy, elastic energy, nuclear, and gravitational potential energy. So we'll start our um, discovery here on potential energy. So the first one I want to talk about is gravitational potential energy. Um, gravitational potential energy depends on mass and height. So at the top of a roller coaster, you're going to have the most gravitational potential energy. Um, that's because gravity wants to pull you down towards the Earth. Um, hydropower um, also uses uh, gravitational potential energy. Um, the water behind the uh, dam here builds up, and it uses that gravitational potential energy of the height difference to create power in a turbine. Okay, so a little bit more about the gravitational potential energy equation. Um, oops, I thought I had another slide before this. Yeah, here we go before we get on to that heavy math stuff. I want you to show me, and hopefully you have a writing utensil in your hand, how you can increase the gravitational potential energy of your pencil. So let's say I'm holding my pencil right here. How would I increase, this is a pen, how would I increase the gravitational potential energy of my pen or my pencil? Hey, why don't you think about it? You could do a couple things. Let's say that we're not gonna change the acceleration due to gravity, because we're on Earth and the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is always the same, it's 9.8 meters per second squared. So there's two things that we could do to change the gravitational potential energy of this pencil. 
We could change the math of the pencil, but that would require maybe going back to remake the pencil to the pencil factory or adding an eraser or a bunch of little silly writing things to it. Um, or we could change the height. So if we change the height of the pen or the pencil, we automatically change the gravitational potential energy. That's because gravitational potential energy depends on mass and height of the object. So this, in this position, the pen has less gravitational potential energy. And in this position, position, it has more gravitational potential energy. So you can get really uh, detailed with that math here. Um, if we say that the mass of a pencil is about five grams, here's our equation, gravitational potential energy is mass times gravity times height. So increasing the height of the pencil will therefore increase its gravitational potential energy. The mass of the pencil is five grams. We'll say that's 0 0.05 kilograms because we always want to be using kilograms when we're calculating for mass in a um, equation like this. Um, we'll take the acceleration due to gravity and its height, and we'll calculate that the gravitational potential energy for the pencil at a height of 10 centimeters above your desk is 0 0.49 joules. Okay. Um, then once I move the pencil up, it still has the same mass. I didn't add or change anything to the mass. That's 0 0.005 kilograms still. And this time our height is 30 centimeters because I raised it up um, to a higher position. So now my gravitational potential energy is 1.47 joules. So simply by increasing an object's position for height, you can increase its gravitational potential energy. Okay. What are other types of uh, potential energy? Elastic potential energy is energy stored due to being stretched or compressed. For example, springs and rubber bands or archery all utilize elastic potential energy. Chemical potential energy um, is the energy stored in bonds between atoms. Some examples of chemical potential energy are food and fuel. So I like to think of my favorite food, tacos, or um, a gasoline can, or even a battery when I think about chemical potential energy. The energy is stored in the atoms of the um, chemical bonds of your food, or gasoline, or um, the chemicals in the battery. Okay, what are other types? Um, we're still on nuclear potential energy. Nuclear potential, nuclear potential energy is the energy stored in the nucleus of an atom. It is the most concentrated form of energy. And I know a lot of you have already taken Ms. Donde's physical science matter class, and you might know a little bit more about nuclear energy. Um, so that's awesome. We're not going to cover anything more here. You just need to know that it is a type stored in the nucleus of an atom. All right, we've done all of the um, potential energies. So now we're gonna move on to some kinetic energies. Um, mostly we're gonna be talking about thermal energy and electrical energy. I've already talked about mechanical energy and we've already covered a lot about magnets. So we'll focus on these today. Um, as well as I wanna talk about sound and light energy. Um, so that will come after um, we talk about kinetic energy. Okay, so kinetic energy can also be calculated using this equation. Um, kinetic energy is the energy that objects possess due to their motion. So all moving objects have um, kinetic energy. Put this really fast picture of a race car here. I thought my computer was being weird, but that's just race car picture. All right, so moving objects, they all have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy equals one half times mass times velocity squared. So we practiced with this equation in the classroom. Um, if you go on to physics, you'll definitely use this equation. Um, mass is object's mass. Velocity is how fast it's going in what direction. And then kinetic energy is always measured in joules. So if you know an object's mass and its speed or its velocity, you can calculate the amount of kinetic energy an object has as well. All right, so how does kinetic energy change, let's say, if you were to double the mass of a car? So let's say we have this small red car that's 10 grams, and we're going to double it, and we want to see the effect of, um, of um, how we change the mass on the kinetic energy. So 20 grams of mass on this car, um, and the same velocity, even if the, cars are, the red car is going 10 meters per second and the yellow car is going 10 meters per second, 
um, when we do these calculations, plugging in for all of our knowns here, we get um, 0 0.5 moles of energy the red car would have traveling. And while in motion, the yellow car will have 1.0 joules of kinetic energy. So if you double the mass of an object, you're doubling the amount of kinetic energy on the object as well. It works different for velocity. Because velocity is squared in this equation, every time you double the velocity, you're actually quadrupling the amount of kinetic energy. Um, and if you were to triple the velocity, you would actually um, times nine the amount of kinetic energy in the object. So that relationship works differently for velocity. Um, but for mass, it works um, in an equivalent ratio. If you double the mass of the object, you double the amount of kinetic energy in the object. All right, more about kinetic energy. A different type of kinetic energy is called thermal energy. This is the type of energy responsible for cooking our food in convex convention type and convection type heating. Um, also, uh, the energy in matches is thermal energy. Electrical kinetic energy is the type of energy that involves the movement of electrons in wires or um, conductive materials. Um, some other examples are lightnings or current in your appliances. Um, we do a circuit lab usually um, in physical science. Um, but we just did not have time to get through with this online distance learning. So I encourage you to look up more things about circuits. And there are lots of cool experiments online about how to build your own circuit from some um, household items. So be sure and check that out if you're more interested in electrical energy and circuits. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, sound energy. They're calling it kinetic energy um, because it is the vibration of movement through substance and waves. So if you're thinking about my voice right now or your own voice, the way that we make sound with our voice is our vocal cords vibrate at a certain frequency um, and it moves the air particles into so another person can sense it with their ear. Okay, so if you put your fingers on your vocal cords when you're talking, you can feel some vibrations. Um, that's how sound energy is produced um, through the vibrations of movement through substances and waves. Okay, um, radiant energy or light energy, as I like to call it, is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are able to see. So, um, visible light is an example, um, X rays are an example, and radio waves are an example. All types of electromagnetic radiant energy um, that is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We usually spend a lot more time talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. These are two slides that I really think that you need to know um, for your future science classes. So you need to know that light and sound energy both travel in waves, all right? These forms of energy are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you can see on this electromagnetic spectrum, that there are two parts to a wave. Um, there is the frequency of the wave and the wavelength. So they're saying that um, power lines have a very low frequency and they're very tall waves or they have a longer wavelength. Um, radio and television waves have a higher frequency and a smaller wavelength, okay? Um, and as you go down on, or go to the right-hand side, oops, sorry, of the electromagnetic spectrum, you're noticing that the frequency is getting faster and faster and also, the same time, our wavelength is getting smaller and smaller. So um, radio and television waves, they're as big as like an Empire State Building, um, but they don't have a very high frequency. Mobile phones, higher frequency, um, sm smaller wave wavelength. Um, right here in between infrared light and ultraviolet light is the type of energy that we can see with our eyes called visible light. And this is uh, responsible for our rainbow colors, uh, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And this is, the, um, this is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can actually see that we know as light. Okay, so here's another uh, great diagram on the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so they're saying this one, 
oh yeah, it's great. So <clears throat> here's radio waves as big as buildings. They have a frequency of 10 to the fourth Hertz and they are very uh, cold. They don't have a temperature really associated with them because they are such low energy waves, okay? Um, but when you get over here, so like um, right, right after visible light where we can see, um, see the energy in the forms of the colors that we see, um, the temperature is 10,000 kelvins or 9,727 degrees Celsius. Um, so our sun is actually in this range of visible light because we get our light from the sun, our solar energy. Um, so this is the frequency and wavelength for most of the energy that we can see as visible light, right? Um, as you get more and more to the right-hand side of this uh, diagram, you notice that once again, ultraviolet light, X-rays and gamma rays are going to be shorter wavelength type of energy with a much faster frequency going back and forth very, very, very fast. All right, now we're gonna talk about the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that energy can change forms, but it is never lost. This law means that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Rather, it can only be transformed or transferred from one form to another. Really important law in science class. Okay, here's an example. So a roller coaster car has a lot of potential energy as it sits at the top of the first hill. This energy is converted to kinetic energy when the car begins at the very top. That kinetic energy is then converted back into potential energy at the bottom of the hill, and it ascends the second hill, increasing its potential energy, but decreasing its kinetic energy. As it gets to the top of the hill, it has the most potential energy, where then again it decreases its potential energy, increasing its kinetic energy, picking up speed, and going on about the roller coaster at some speed. So that's how you can describe the trans, um, the energy being transferred into potential to kinetic. Um, people, uh, this roller coaster analogy is a pretty good one because it's really simple to understand. Um, okay, so now transformations. I want to talk more about these. Energy is a strange uh, property of objects that is sometimes not easy to see and sometimes it's easier to see. So like money, energy can be transferred, transformed, or stored. I want to first want to talk about what the word transferred means. Transferred energy means that energy from one object flows into another object. So if you've ever played pool or billiards, um, when you hit the cue ball, the cue ball goes really fast, it has a lot of kinetic energy, and it collides with another, let's say, the yellow ball. Um, the yellow ball um, has potential energy, but it doesn't have any kinetic energy because it's just staying there. Once it gets hit by the, with the white cue ball, then it has a lot of kinetic energy and less potential energy. Now the cue ball has more potential energy and less kinetic energy because it hit the yellow ball. Well, that energy didn't really get lost, it just got transferred. The kinetic energy from the cue ball transferred to the kinetic energy in the yellow ball. It didn't change forms, it just changed objects. Transformed. When energy is transformed, it changes from one type into another type of energy. For an example, an electric heater. An electric heater transforms energy because it takes electrical energy and it transforms that into thermal or heat energy. So when it changes the type of energy, we say that energy is transformed. Other times, um, energy is just stored. So this is where the uh, money analogy really comes in play really well. Um, other times, wealth is being stored somewhere the way money is being stored in the bank. You can have a lot of potential energy stored somewhere, um, like a bag. Okay, energy transformation, just to recap, is process of energy changing from one form to another, this transformation is often able to be seen because it produces a change in the object's motion, position, temperature, or appearance. Here's another example. When you're riding your bike, what are the energy transformations taking place? So let's talk about this. 
you have your breakfast, you have chemical potential energy stored in the food from your breakfast. Um, then you, um, that potential energy stored in your food is transferred to mechanical energy as you're moving your muscles to ride the bike, all right? Um, it's applying force or doing work to the bike pedals. Also, some of that energy from your food gets converted to heat because you sweat and you get hot as you begin to exercise. Um, the bike itself, as you're applying your mechanical energy to make it move, you're actually um, giving the, uh, transferring your mechanical energy, transforming your mechanical energy into kinetic energy. Um, it says the force of friction between the tires and the ground transform the motion into thermal energy, heat, and sound energy. So if you're thinking about riding your bike, um, this last part here is that the kinetic energy of your bike on the wheels has some energy that's moving into the ground as thermal energy. If you think about friction, about rolling friction in this case, and sound energy, because you can hear, right? When you um, ride your bike, you can hear the tires on the ground. Some of that kinetic energy is actually converted into sound. So energy is never lost, it's just uh, changed from one form to another form. And that's what the point of all of these really detailed energy transformations um, explanations is, is to really um, make sure that you know that energy is never created or destroyed. It only ever changes forms or changes in, um, from one object to a different object. All right, um, we talk a lot in the classroom about energy efficiency. Um, this is really important when you're talking about energy transformations as well. So the most likely cause of energy being lost in an object is through heat energy. But like I said, it's not really lost, it's just that it's converted into heat and not something useful. So as we actually invented light bulbs and we became more efficient with how we invented the technology behind a light bulb, um, we saw that we were losing more energy to heat. So we do this in the classroom where we hook all these light bulbs up and then I have you feel on the different type of light bulbs and you can actually feel the heat difference. And these older type of light bulbs that were called incandescent light bulbs, you can actually feel that they have a lot of heat lost. Um, they're, they're still bright, but they have a lot of heat lost when you put your hand close to it or next to it. Um, then we got a little bit smarter and we started um, uh, using compact fluorescent light. Um, and these have a little, they're a little bit more energy efficient. They don't lose as much energy to heat. Um, and they, they're a little bit brighter. And then, um, then the, the most energy efficient light bulb nowadays are LED light bulbs, which actually, if you put your hand next to an LED light bulb, it feels almost cool. It's not even hot at all. And so you can really tell that these are the most efficient type of light bulbs. And this is really important when you're paying for your own electricity, right? You want to have a efficient, um, light bulbs in your house because it will actually end up saving you money. You're not just paying for uh, the, the light bulb just to uh, give off this heat that isn't, isn't actually helping you light your room. So um, energy efficiency we talk a lot more about in the classroom. Um, we also talk a lot more about renewable energy. Um, I'm going to have you do this slide um, on your own if you want. Um, I have linked the slideshow from this lecture in um, the same assignment. So if you wanna do fill in the missing types and try and explain your energy transformation while listening to a podcast, I encourage you to do that. It would be good practice for you. Okay, um, but the other thing that we really didn't have time for this year is talking about renewable energy resources. And then I was listening to the news and I heard this um, news line and I really could not help myself but to share it with you all. So um, U.S. renewable energy consumption beats coal for the first time in 130 years. This is huge. This is a huge news headline. So for the longest time, um, we have been dependent on coal and fossil fuels for energy. Um, this is the first time in 130 years that renewable energy resources have surpassed um, coal and fossil, uh, just coal, for um, uh, being consumed. So I wanted to read this part to you right down here. 
the rise of renewables and declining coal electricity generation resulted in energy consumption from renewables in the United States surpassing in 2019 coal consumption for the first time since 1885. Um, this is reported from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Last year, total U.S. renewable energy consumption increased by 1%. So just a 1% increase, everybody's using more renewable energy resources by 1% and coal consumption decreased or slumped by almost 15% year on year, um, says the Energy Information Administration. The rise of renewable energy resources, especially wind and solar power, marked a historic milestone for energy consumption in the United States last year for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. This is huge. This is huge news, folks. Renewable energy resources overtook coal as a source of energy. So um, I'm showing you this graph too. Uh, every since the country founded the United States of America, which happened in 1976, um, we have been started using uh, renewables. The last time we used more renewables than coal was when people were burning wood um fires and that's how they made most of their food and heated most of their homes was from wood fires in 1885 ever since then in the industrial revolution we have been dependent on coal as our energy our most used energy resource and so this is really cool that this is changing because we know the damaging effects that coal um, burning coal has on our environment if you are more interested in renewable energy resources there are two awesome opportunities for you to do this week that are totally optional but i totally encourage you to do with them um, i usually spend a lot more time on renewable energy resources in the class so if you're curious please email me or just do some research on your own about renewable energy resources um, it is something that i'm committed to as an educator so please let me know if you have any questions about those optional activities i would love to talk it over with you okay I think that is all for this lesson. Um, I hope that you all have enjoyed this science class and I'm gonna keep this short and sweet because I know I've already been talking a lot, but watch your other videos, get your assignments in, have a great summer.